Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the piano tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Welcome, everybody, to Piano Tech Radio Hour. On today's show, we've got Owen Lovell, and Owen is the piano review editor for Larry Fine's Acoustic and Digital Piano Buyer, the standard consumer reference for piano shoppers. He holds a bachelor's and master's degrees in performance from the Peabody Conservatory in Baltimore and a doctorate from UT Austin. He has appeared as a soloist and chamber musician throughout America as well as internationally. Owen is currently an associate professor of music at Georgia College. He has trained as a piano technician under our good friend, Sally Phillips. How are you doing today, Owen? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, happy, happy Memorial Day to everybody or Memorial Day weekend anyway to everyone. Yeah. Um, it's great to be here. Excellent. It's great to have you. Very excited. I know that I've known Larry Fine for, and had him at my house, and he's a close colleague for a couple, at least a couple of decades. So very excited to meet somebody that's allied with him and that, that, that knows him and what an incredible human being he is. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Before I launch with our first question here, I will um, just remind everybody this event is being brought to you by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, an online educational resource that offers you cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. You can find out more at www.pianotechniciansmasterclass.com slash PTM2020. And Owen, what I'd like to launch the conversation off with here is if you could just tell us a little bit about how you did get involved with Piano Buyer and Larry Fine in the first place. When did that happen and what's the story there? Sure, sure, sure. So my primary position, I'm an academic. You know, I'm a state university professor and mere civil servant. And I've been a piano professor for about 15 years at this point. And so th this sort of just came out as a way to feed my inner piano nerd. You can't really talk to a lot of your family members and your friends about your passion for the instrument and all the little tiny vagaries of, of, of how it goes together and what parts are in there and all that sort of stuff. So I was on the Piano World Internet Forum and Larry and uh, Steve Cohen from uh, the Baltimore area put out a call. They were looking for guest reviewers. Piano Buyer, the evolution of Piano Book had just come online. And so the first couple of reviews we, we had were with uh, Steve Brady's wife. We had Mary Cushing Smith, technician, come in and do a review. But he wanted to get uh, some perspective from some uh, professional pianists as well to have additional reviewers available. So I basically just answer, answered an internet want ad. So we wrote a review of kind of the lower priced, uh, what was that review? Uh, it was called sort of grade three value pianos. I think it was, we were looking at Petrovs, we were looking at lower line channels, we were looking at a few pianos like that, and, and we just sort of hit it off in terms of just the relationship as a writer and a player. And so I was invited back to write a couple of additional reviews. And then he came to realize that my network of people as an academic is a little bit different. And I might have access to more professional pianists who can provide professional reviews and be able to write. Because this is one of the tough parts about this is trying to identify. You can find really good pianists and you can find really good writers, but it's really hard to find people that can do both. So my primary position for Piano Buyer is I'm the, the review editor. So some of the reviews I write myself, some of the reviews I select uh, other pianists to write the reviews and I'll edit the reviews along with Larry and also sort of choosing the products that we choose to review in each issue. So this is the paper version of it. This is the best of Piano Buyer here. Let me get it in the light. So this is sort of a static thing that you can buy at a bookstore or on Amazon or probably even through the Piano Buyer website. And that is a lot of just general consumer information articles that are more timeless. Then this is the pricing supplement. That comes out twice a year, fall and spring, that we update what the market prices are for things in the digital and acoustic new piano market. And then there's a wealth of information, including stuff that came from the old piano book 
on the Piano Buyer website, pianobuyer.com, which is both mobile and desktop ready. So yeah, sorry for the rambling answer. There, no, but, that's, uh, that's great. Good information. And you're reminding me of my initial fascination, you know, of course, with Larry Fine and, and the website that it's now become is the original book he wrote, which, which is really an amazing consumer reference. You know, that's the, the piano book. I remember reading that when I first found it as a piano technician, and I, I, was, I was just so impressed because it was so consumer oriented. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like tilted towards a dealer or it wasn't tilted towards all oh, the piano technician and how they feel about everything. It was like, you know, you're a consumer, you wanna learn as much as you can about the piano, but you don't have a ton of time and was just really impressed with that. Was that one of your first encounters with, with Larry? Was that, that book as well? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, my, my first encounter with, with Larry's work was taking a piano technology class as a senior at the Peabody Conservatory. That was taught by Greg Hudak and Caleb Sy. It was sort of a, a crash course in, here's a little bit of information about how pianos are built. Here's a little bit about regulation. Here's a little bit about how to tune an F, F temperament. Uh, here's the Braid White book. Uh, this is back in the 90s, mind you. So you know, part of the well, required textbook for that course was the third edition of the piano book. And that was where I honestly learned as an American trained pianist about a lot of these different brands that are out there that I probably didn't even hear of or know about. And so that was just exciting. It opened up kind of a whole new world to me that way. I've known Larry, as I said, for a long time. And I saw what he had to go through in terms of criticism when the piano book first came out, like manufacturers were shooting arrows in him. Piano technicians were shooting arrows in him. How dare you reveal our hidden you know, Hogwarts stuff, you know? And how dare you reveal blah, 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 blah. And it just flipped. And he was just honest and like authentic and no ads for so long that people just decided to trust him. And then it became the Bible. And that's an amazing legacy for you to be involved with. Oh, yeah, definitely. It, it's been interesting to hear some of the stories from him about, you know, going to the early NAMM shows and, you know, looking at inventory and looking at, at instruments. And I, I even came across a second edition piano book that had a, a letter inside where I think he was threatened to not publish a review of a particular brand of pianos. And then he changed his mind. And again, it's, it's sort of a consumer focus of actually publishing that review so that people had a source of honest information. This becomes even more tricky now, honestly, in, in the internet era uh, where Piano Buyer has gone from the piano book, because a lot of the internet reviews of things that you read are kind of just rehashed press releases a lot of the time. And so it, it's, it's, it's tricky and it's important to have some editorial independent commentary out there. Wow. I'm so glad we're getting to know you, my friend, because you are a fascinating example of this awesome domain of piano nerds, right? <laughs> piano techno nerds. Like you're an insane player. Maybe we'll get a chance to hear, you know, half a minute of you playing the piano at speed and a piano technician and a piano tuner and an insane student of what's going on in this world. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, for sure. Oh, sure. It's super fun. My, my mind is bursting with questions. But do we have questions yet from... Uh... We don't have questions in the chat yet. And I think what I was going to just make sure and give a moment to call out to people, like as you get to, you, you'll get to know Owen a little better. I, I did a little pre-interview call with him a few days ago, but you'll get to know him a little bit better as we continue. And I'm, I think the questions will start to, to pour out about like what he's into and what he knows, what he doesn't know. One thing I'd like to ask is, what do you know, if you know anything about the state of the piano industry when we started to go into quarantine. You know, it started in China, right. which is a big place for, for manufacturing and pianos in general. Do you have, is there your, is anything coming to your ear through the grapevine here? Yeah, it, it was interesting. You know, the timeline of all this has just been just tremendous and just shocking and, and all kinds of things. And I, I do feel very much for the technician community because in a lot of ways, you guys are bearing the brunt of this economically in, in a lot of places that are locked down and even places that aren't at this point. 
so th this year's NAM show, NAM, NAM is in Anaheim in, in January, late January. So everything was conducting itself normally at that point. People were shaking hands, people were hugging each other, people were in big crowds. We didn't really know very much about what was going on other than you know, an oblique reference to it. And so I never got ill. My wife and, and one of the reviewers I brought with me actually both became sick with some of the symptoms of that. It was, the timeline is such that we don't really know, but personal stories aside, the industry has sort of followed the, as things have started to shut down. It hasn't been everywhere all at once. It's been gradually from place to place. So most of the factories are offline at this point. You know, I know if, if you're trying to get Steinway parts and you're trying to call Pete and parts at the Steinway factory, they're probably not picked up the phone right now because I think, you know, they're still in lockdown in New York City. Uh, as far as I know, I think the stage one of reopening plan when that region is cleared does allow manufacturing to resume, but I don't think they've reached that point yet. So on the manufacturer side, it's, it's, everything's been pretty much idle. And of course, that goes to the supplier levels as well. And then the trickle down effect of this has, has been interesting in the industry where distribution has been, of course, impacted. So a lot of the things, I mean, the supply house. Uh, Owen, before we go down the chain, let's, let me ask you about, now, is that true globally? I mean, Steinway, yes, but Mason Hammond, yes. Walter, yes. Uh, Beckstein, yes. Steingraber, yes. I mean, as far, as far as I know, the people I've talked to in Europe and the people I've talked to in America indicate that the factories are pretty much offline at this point. I haven't really talked to a lot of my contacts in Asia about that because uh, it's sort of, a, it's sort of a, a sore subject to even want to talk about right now in terms of just, you know, the devastation. I, I understand, but data, da data is data. Anyway, fascinating. Go on. So uh, on the digital piano side of things, it's been interesting because I think what do we sell about 30,000 acoustic new pianos a year right now? If you look at the music trade stats and you're probably in America at about what 150,000 digital instruments are being sold right now. And so as the distribution hasn't really been happening, so a lot of distribution is reconfigured towards delivery of essential supplies. If you've tried to get something on Amazon, you know, a month or so ago, you probably couldn't get it unless it was something you absolutely needed on a long wait. Inventories in the warehouses have definitely kind of sh shifted what's even available. And then, of course, on the dealer level, some of you know this because of your affiliations with the dealers. We're looking at anything between dealers that are still closed because of lockdown orders, dealers that are still closed because they choose to be and they don't really think the business is there yet. Um, people that are appointment only or people that are operating sort of on a skeleton crew. I don't really know a lot of dealers that are operating at 100% capacity, even in states that are more open in the U.S. than others. So it's been, it's been very impactful. And unfortunately, I think we're going to see there are going to be some casualties from this round of what's going on. This is a, this is a huge event. And I just hope that you know this this thing mutates into something else, or a vaccine becomes available, or something that, even from my point of view personally, you know, I I am in a comfortable position in that I'm a professor and I'm able to continue to teach. It's worse, but it's still happening. But uh, my side technician income has kind of gone away as well. Honestly, I've given a lot of that work away to other full time technicians when it's become available, just because it's it's got to be a, a scary a scary thing for for a lot of, of you all. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And you're in this fairly unique position of having your hands and feet in all these worlds. And that's why I find this really fascinating. So we've talked about the impact on every level. So where do you see it January 21? Boy, you know, I think that's, that's a really kind of salient date, isn't it? That we, we sort of look at that time period and say, you know, are we going to have the tools to return to normal or not? Yeah. And I, boy, I, I really can't say at this point. It's going to be fascinating to see what the next NAM show is going to look like. You know, is, is it going to be anything resembling the 150,000 people that descend on the Anaheim Convention Center over four days the same way that it was before? Yep. Yeah, it's an amazing question. And all we have is speculative fantasy to answer it and some data from from scientists and virologists that have been working on this stuff for 20 30 40 years but in terms of 
where the culture is going to be, where the economy is going to be. It's, we know it's going to be radically different than now, but we don't know how it's right. going to be. The one thing I can, uh, if it's any solace to the piano technician community, the one thing I can say is that the interest, a lot of customers, a lot of people that are shopping contact Larry and I as well. And that interest in playing the piano has gone up. It's stable or up. Oh, from before, as people have been forced into the situation that they've been forced into. So I think the demand for, you know, the piano as an instrument, you know, where that's going to be, the market demographics may change as, as people's income and discretionary income to purchase pianos changes. But I think that the need for the tech work is still going to be there because the, the interest in piano playing, if anything, is revitalized during this tough time. I totally agree. And I've been in, in touch with... I'm super in touch with artisan rebuilders all up and down California and Arizona, and they're chugging along. The high end of the re piano rebuilding, the, the basically the one-person shop or the two-person shop that can do six or eight pianos a year or something like that, those guys are rocking, you know? I have to assume that, yeah, those, those of you that have the ability to have a shop space and be doing some repair and rebuilding work have at least some means of a little bit of sustenance when the, when the tuning income and the, and the on-call and the on, in-person service has, yep. has gone away. But yep. goodness, we can just hope it starts to come back. Ethan, let's go into our beloved brothers and sisters questions. Perfect. So our friend uh, and previous guest, Rich Galassini, has a question. He says, how do you see the mission of Piano Buyer today, and how have you seen it change since the days of the piano book? Well, I mean, the, the mission of the Piano Buyer is still, the primary mission is to educate consumers about the new piano market on the acoustic side and the digital side. We also now talk about accessories. We have a lot of informational articles. Now, a lot of members that I'm talking to today I know our, our Piano Technicians Guild members and your site has a lot of really good articles. And we even mentioned you know, some of the, the consumer shopping articles that are out there that are on the PTG site. And I look at the piano buyer as even a deeper reference into a lot of those areas of even shopping for a used piano, shopping for a rebuilt piano and what that means. And so it's not only the new piano market that's mentioned in the publication. The way that it's changed from the piano book days to the piano buyer days are uh, pretty clear. The, the piano book had these wonderfully hand illustrated articles a lot that were sort of, if you were going and shopping for a piano as a lay person, what does it look like when the bridge is split? What does it look like when the tuning pins have been doped? And that sort of stuff. And we've gradually started to bring some of those articles into the, the new piano buyer and available online as well so that you can see some of that. We've obviously had to expand a lot of our coverage about the digital market. So in a typical piano buyer issue or, or new release, I'm going to have an equal amount of acoustic piano reviews as I do digital piano reviews highlighted. But as we've been around now, I think the first edition of Piano Buyer was about 2009. We've kind of been around the block uh, with a lot of the things sort of once already. And so we've kind of gone into other accessory areas, for example. So. We have a, an accessory review. I don't know if you've, if you've all worked with a pianist who have done uh, the iPad instead of paper music and then used a Bluetooth page turner as what they use to kind of turn pages. And so we did a review of all the different Bluetooth page turning uh, products that were out there uh, with a professional pianist that used them. So it's tried to come along with the technology. It's, of course, it's gone online as everything. You know, the, the old piano book was not online. Piano bar was because it had to be. As, as the internet era really ramped up, it was easy for people to take, instead of buying a copy of the piano book or the piano book price supplement, to just type that stuff in on an internet form and send it out to everybody. So, you know, the way that the book is structured, it, it has advertising at this point, which it did not have before. But to, to Larry's credit, one of the things that I would point out is that I, I, as the piano review editor, have nothing to do with the advertising portion of what piano buyer is. I'm kept completely separate from that. And even if we're writing a review of a product, we might send a couple of things in the introductory paragraphs out for a fact check, but we're typically not going to send a review out 
to a company and, and then have them yell at us and threaten us or that sort of thing that we really do try to have that be editorial ind independent from what was before. So in that sense, the spirit of it really tries to stay in a, in a similar vein to what the piano book was doing. And that's, that's overwhelmingly to me and for me, the brand of the piano book, piano bar is we can trust these people, you know, and that, that was hard won, but it's, it's huge. Absolutely. And I think, I think David and I w would also love to just interject this as I'm sure a lot of people on this call agree, but it's, it's useful to say, I think as piano technicians, it's really easy to kind of think about our own best interests and, you know, how are we going to make, make things work for ourselves. And I think the truth fleshes out in the end is when you do keep the consumer in mind, you know, that it's really about them and optimizing their experience, being upfront, being honest with them, you know, even when you have difficult things you have to communicate, it tends to make better business for, for a piano technician in the long run to kind of be like the piano book. It's kind of, that's why I love giving the that's piano true. book out to clients and things like that. Well, yeah, that, that sense of trust. I mean, you know, once it's gone, it's gone. So that, that, that sense of trust is so, so important. And, and, and that you hold that and, and really understand the core of, the, of your appeal of your brand is really beautiful. I'm, I'm, I'm loving to hear this because I had so much respect for Larry and his holding of the ethics of the brand for is a quarter century from well and I mean he does hold the technician community in high esteem too I mean a, a lot of the way a lot of the reasons why I know the names of the people that I'm seeing on the screen here is is through him and through some of the staff we have a, we have a small crew of staff and advisors that we have for the piano buyer team and we do include technicians in that so Larry interviewed me and wrote an article and around the interview with me as a restorer and the head of a restoring team, the first issue of Piano Bar was a tremendous honor for me. Right. And, you know, from that point of view, it, it's been, we, we don't just talk about the new piano market. We do talk a lot about the new piano market because, again, we sort of see this as a resource of, of the information, probably the best resource of that information that's available. But we have done articles on the New York area rebuilders. We've done an article on different philosophies of rebuilding, people that like to rebuild instruments with the original specifications, people that like to sort of remanufacture the instruments and change scale design aspects and things like that. And so it's, it's, it's interesting and it's dynamic too, uh, that we are open to ideas for other articles from the technician community, just like we are from all sides of the, of the industry. And so we're, we are, uh, it's a small crew of people here at Piano Bar, but we are pretty responsive. So, you know, as you have ideas for things, we're always looking ahead to, you know, what's the next issue's articles going to be? And it needs to be a balance of things. I would encourage uh, a lot of the people that are, that are watching this to, to submit their ideas and submit, hey, have you thought about this? Or I would really love to talk about this and, 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 and contact us. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and it's also like in terms of, putting content out there, especially online, if it's quality content, you know, it, you guys don't have to necessarily be uber concerned with, is this going to sell content, right? If it's quality content, you'll consider it and put it up there if it can be shared with an audience that really cares about it. So I think that that's really great. I want to go on to another comment here, which I think is cool, which I didn't realize. Ashley Turner has said that Hannah Beckett and she have been doing a piano buyer book group. <laughs> is there a way wow. that they can show this recording to those students? Yes, of course. Ashley, there'll be a follow-up. Uh, you'll get the, a link to the recording of this event after, so you can share that with them. And you can be in touch with me. I think she may have also earlier asked for, somebody asked for your email. So we'll, we can give that privately, or if you want to say it, you can. But um, that sounds like a great thing, Ashley. I'd love to hear more about that. Well, uh, we should have Ashley and Hannah, Hannah Beckett on. Sure. Yeah. And I'd, and I'd be happy to speak to speak with them as well. And, and you can reach me at owen at pianobuyer.com. Easy to remember. <laughs> uh, you got anything else, David, or should I go to the next comment question here? 
Yeah, just go to the comment that you were talking about. Uh, as a piano technician, this is from Mark Steiger. I get requests to do piano appraisals. Any thoughts, recommendations on how to do a formal appraisal? And this may not be your area of expertise, Owen, but if you have any thoughts, let us know. Right. I, I think the, the, the book and the price supplement are useful because we do provide at least sort of a rough depreciation schedule of how if you take a, a piano that, that exists in the market, let's say if you take a Yamaha U1 that's 20 years old, there's a sort of a formula that we've put together with some of the staff to, talk, to, to discuss. Take the street price of a new one, depreciate it by about this percentage, and then there's a sort of a little wiggle room for the condition of the instrument to kind of come up with a rough estimate of pricing. Now, of course, that's not legally binding or anything like that, but it's sort of a rough industry guide that we can use as a way to provide that information. Now, appraisals, it's my understanding, and the technician community is going to know even better than I do, that, that appraisals has taken on kind of a little bit different tack uh, in terms of being certified to do this sort of stuff as, as, from an IRS point of view, if I'm not mistaken. Is that, is that your understanding, David? Yeah, if you want to put that instrument in some kind of an, an instrument of money, taxes, whatever, yes. In an overabundance of caution, you would pay three or 400 bucks for a, for, for a guy that's, for a person that's licensed and certified and been doing it for a long time. And there's, there's one man in our community that's famous for it lives in New York. His name's Leopold Holder. Right. I mean, if, if somebody comes to me and asks me to help appraise the value of an instrument, I'm going to use the piano buyer and the piano buyer price supplement to kind of come up with a rough neighborhood of where that might be. I'm going to look at comps. So I'm going to go on Piano Mart and I'm going to look and see whether anybody else is selling something like that at the same price range. And then ideally, if I can be hired to inspect the instrument and sort of comment on its condition, one of the things that I've sort of liked telling customers recently, and I'd be kind of curious to hear the reactions of the tech community, is instead of just hiring for an inspection, occasionally I've been asked to consult for somebody who's buying something remotely. I'll hire a technician to tune the piano and then give me a report on it after that, because then they have their hand on every tuning pin. They hear every string. They hear how the hammers fit. They hear how the voicing is. They feel what that regulation is from hitting the note multiple times. I feel personally, and again, it doesn't really answer your question, Ethan, but I do feel personally that it sort of provides an even more useful tool than if, of course, you need to pull the action and take a look around. But I think that hiring somebody to do a tuning is an even more meaningful way to get a complete assessment of the condition of the instrument. I, I think that's a brilliant idea. And I think you're right. Everything in your body and your being and your head change when, a, when an instrument is in tune. It's like, oh, it's like a psycho, huge psychoacoustic illusion when you tune the piano. Oh my God, this is, you know, like that. So that's brilliant. Good job. Next comment here, just a little comment from Alan Edder, who we knew out there in Cali. And he says, a piano book is a consumer reports for uninitiated piano shoppers, impartial and assumes no prior knowledge. Again, just reinforcing that reputation, which is great. Yeah. I had a question I want to move the conversation along a little bit. And of course, more questions and comments are welcome from the chat or Facebook or YouTube. Owen, you, you have this really cool opportunity to, I don't know, get to know the industry and, and be a player and like find out about the cool new things going on or what's, what are the interesting pianos to use. So I just want to know, like, what are the pianos that you've had over the years? And do you have any stories about how you came upon those particular pianos? Right. My piano history is shockingly long at this point. Uh, I probably need to cut it out so that I can <laughs> retire at some point in my life. In terms of what I had personally, grandma's big old upright that moved into our home when I was five. Uh, I had a Canadian new Lesage uh, studio. That was my first piano growing up that, after that big old upright. I had a Yamaha G1 that we purchased around 1990. That was a used piano from 1982. So that's up through college. And then uh, after college, my first big purchase was a Schimmel 130 Upright. That was the first big purchase I made other than my education as an adult. So I was really proud to pay that one off when that happened. And 
And so I, I'll always be a little, it's at my in-laws house. I don't have room for multiple pianos in my home. I don't have a large home. I'll be, always be reluctant to sell it because I, that, that's the one that I actually have an emotional connection to because it was such a triumphant moment to pay it off. After that, I had a Beckstein A190 uh, from the Academy series, wow. their second line. Um, after that, I had a Shigeru Kawai SK6, seven footer. And, and I just to interrupt real quick, like say like on the A190, do you remember like what your process of acquiring that was and like how you decided that that was your piano at the time? Sure, sure. The, the A190 was a uh, result of a really long search to go to a lot of different places. You have to remember that as a college professor, I play a lot of New York Steinways at work. So I wasn't necessarily as interested in owning one because I had access to Steinway concert brands that were relatively new, rebuilt and newer Steinway brands as my teaching tools. So I sort of enjoyed the variety of having different voices. So the Beckstein kind of scratched that itch. It was in a wood finish. It had a very different sort of voice. It had green felt. I mean, come on, how many pianos do we have out there that, that had green felt? Um, so, uh, <laughs> only Polish, Polish. Yeah. And you know, they've changed that at the factory. I have to, I always whine at them every time I see them. They've changed away from the green felt just recently. So when you start... To oh, that's shockingly horrific. I know, it's just travesty. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, so it was, it was just to have something that was interesting and sounded great and had a different sort of voice and it fit the, the price range that I had. And I liked having one in a wood finish just instead of something that was flat black. So uh, it, was, it was fun to, uh, the Shiguro that I owned after that, I was being called for a job interview. Uh, I was starting to look for a seven footer and I got a call for a job interview and it was a situation where I couldn't practice at work because they would know that I was interviewing for a job somewhere else. So I, I basically said to, I was in Wisconsin at the time, I said to my friends over at Tim Farley's shop, Farley's House of Pianos, you know, can, if you make me a deal on this thing, I'll just stop my search and, and get this. And so it was, it was fun to see the, the Japanese master piano artisan come to my home or my apartment at the time. And I literally took the day off of work so I could just watch everything that he did. Yeah, I call those guys piano monks. Yeah, and I mean, Terry worked, I think he worked for eight and a half hours. He didn't eat. I think you took a drink oh. of water once. Thank you for verifying my, my label. Yeah. Jeez. And it was, it was also amazing to see what he was able to do with just an action uh, cat. I'm trying to remember what, it, what, what the tool is called, but it's, it's something you bolt on the key bed so you can slide the action yeah, yeah, out. Yeah, 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 an action support. Right. And so he was able to do just about everything without taking that action physically out of my piano because the confines of the space were very tight and, I, and they had prepared for that. So that was cool. The next piece of the, in the, my piano history is what I'm talking to you across right here is a Schimmel K230, uh, seven and a half foot. This is the largest thing that will fit in my living room. What year is it? This is, uh, I, this is new last year. Oh, you hit like a certain weird little jackpot. Yeah. I've, I've, I've prepared for sale about four of these in the last, since they completely upgraded and started spitting out these new pianos. Right. These are awesome instruments, man. Yeah, it, it's, been, it's been fun to have an instrument of this size. Obviously, the challenge is just keeping it regulated well enough that you have the control that you need. I live in a 1,500 square foot house. I've got a little bit of a high ceiling in the living room here, but that's pretty much it. So, you know, it, I, I couldn't quite have a D. If I could have had a D, that would have been a really easy search because there's a lot of newer and used ones out there, of course. Uh, but yeah. I, I, my wife did overrule me on getting a D because somebody <laughs> needed to be able to walk through the front door, which would not have been right. possible at that size. Oh, dear, there's a whale in the living room. You got to get it out of here, right? <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to hear hear about that. And do you feel that your relationship with piano buyer has allowed you to to like make better these better decisions? I mean, I'm sure the answer is yes. But is there any details that you have on making your own piano buying decisions? Well, yeah, there's there's a lot. More, I'm a lot more educated, of course, about you know being able to choose an instrument and and being able to evaluate an instrument. I mean, it's it's the ultimate piano nerd job because I get to play literally everything that's for sale in North America and get to walk into the dealers and, and 
and just try everything that's out there. So, you know, if I want to go up to Atlanta to Cooper's or if I want to go up to the Don Bennett shop and Sam Bennett shop up there at Piano Works and, and walk around the rebuild shop and play whatever, it's, it's super fun. People get really scared of going in piano stores and I get excited to go in the piano store. So from that point of view, it, it's definitely different. On the flip side of that, I do have to say, uh, you have to be careful working for the piano buyer in this capacity because it's, you, you can end up in situations where I don't want to call into question the ethics of the book. And so, you know, a manufacturer might really want me to own one of their pianos, but, mm-hmm. you know, I still am going to go through my local dealer uh, through the sale process and, and things like that. Uh, I mean, I would love to be flown to all these factories all over the world and see what's lo- what it's looking like there, but it's not fair of us to, to, expect the company to fly us over there on their dime and to put us up in a hotel and and feed us and then expect me to write something in particular when it comes time to write a review. So I still do a lot of that sort of stuff and I'm afforded a lot of those opportunities because I'm an academic. So it's pretty easy for me to get a concert in a particular place if I just sort of create a concert with another professor who who does what I do over there. Um, but we've been trying to, you know, be careful about how we do that so that I don't put the, the, the publication in any sort of compromising situation as well. And it, it's definitely a concern that way. It's, but it is really cool to have, you know, people whose factories are on the fall board on a first name basis or in your phone. I mean, that's, that's really, it, it is, for the, the, you, you do get kind of starstruck by that in a way. It's amazing. Now here's a possibly controversial and certainly unsettling question. What percentage of dealers that you walk into, and you must have an order of magnitude more experience with this than most of us, even though we're full-time in the business, what percentage would you say of those dealers really do prep their pianos that are on the sale floor? What I'm seeing out in the, in the field generally comes from one of two camps. It's going to be either a, a dealer that minimally preps the inventory, you know, unbox, un, uncrate it, unbox it, take the packing materials out. Maybe, maybe not take out the desiccant bag and the, the little polishing cloth from, from, yeah. the, from the bottom board right. of the upright. Uh, yeah. I've got a nice collection of that, of those of us, I'm sure you do too. They, they either fall into the camp of, you know, tune it and only do what's absolutely necessary. Yeah. Unless you have a client that's coming in and has made an appointment. And that's something that I, when I advise people that are shopping new pianos, when they start to narrow down what they think they want, I advise them really strongly to make appointments days in advance so that you can expect to have a prepared piano. And hopefully some of y'all get the call to come in and set them up. But the other camp of, of course, is going to be the dealers that are not the low price above everything, the service oriented dealers that are going to have either techs on staff or a great Rolodex of, uh, boy, my students are going to get the reference to a Rolodex pretty soon, are they? Uh, but a great Rolodex <laughs> of, of awesome contract techs that they can hire in to do the, pro- the proper prep work. And these are going to be the dealers that aren't going to you know, argue with the customer over an extra $500 of pricing. They're going to they're gonna provide service. Uh, and, and so that, that really hasn't changed too much. In my experience with Piano Buyer, of course, we do give the dealers a heads up that, hey, we're reviewing this piano for the piano buyer, so please have it prepared. That, that takes different, so some people are more thorough about that than others. And so we don't, we, we're not quite secret shoppers. We don't just sort of you know, go in you know, ambush style to the stores, but- uh, Well, yeah. that's right. So they, they, they take special care yeah. to, to do some good work on the pianos that you see. And again, if you're not comfortable doing this, I completely understand, but what percentage of dealers would you say that you walk into provide that service-oriented, okay, kind of like domain-wide yeah. service-oriented thing? I would say probably 20%. I thank you. Would I be about where I, where I would put that. Again, now, each market is a little bit different. You know, when I lived in Western Wisconsin, it was a fiercely price competitive market for some reason in the Twin Cities area. And so there was, there was a little bit less of an opting towards the service oriented, except for maybe one dealer conglomerate in that area. Down here, again, I, I am in a rural area, so I have to travel to be at a piano dealer. I have to go about 100 miles to go to a piano dealer from where I live. I get it completely. 
and speak to the educated piano buyer and what that looks like and whether you can, uh, you know, steer your well-resourced piano clients when they start looking around for something else to, you know, down a chain of ethics, you know. And well, I mean, it's tri- It's a little tricky because think of how, you know, if you want to learn about something, what do we do now? We kind of Google search it first and we, we click on whatever shows up on the first page. And a lot of those, and a lot of those results are going to have sort of an advertising bent to them as well. So I, I think, uh, you know, getting information from a variety of sources is the best way to be an educated client, an educated shopper. And the piano technician piece of that does come into the picture as well. And I, and I do advise people that are shopping, if they're shopping for a second piano, not their first purchase, they probably already have a technician that they're working with. And as the demographics of the U.S. population have changed, you know, what people have for sale and things that, things that could be for sale that, that people don't even know about, especially on the used market, the piano technician can be a great resource that way in being able to identify some things that might be in their budget that they would not necessarily find in a store. So in addition to the store experience, which can be good or it can be bad, some, you know, some of them have evolved and some of them it's sort of the same used car kind of feeling, that, that sort of slimy feeling of, of, of being pitched only what's in the store and always everything negative about what's not in the store. Everybody's a little different about how they handle that. And then, you know, the, the kind of resources that, that what we provide, uh, that's, that's, of course, important. But it's, it's, of course, trickiest for the very first time shop. Uh, so I know that most of my respected uh, brothers and sisters here on this call are piano nerds and are on this call because they want to, they're piano nerds and they want more data and more, more community and more like feeling like, wow, we're doing something. So what about the clients that get kind of obsessed with piano education and piano world and piano publications and then feel they know as much or more than you do about what to do about a piano. And as, as, as a couple of my colleagues have described in the past couple of months about a particular person, they know just enough to be dangerous. That is the- uh, I, I can yeah. certainly sympathize with that sentiment where you might be trying to advise a client that way. And I probably in some ways, in some respects, I'm, I may be guilty of that myself. I mean, you know, I've learned some things technically, uh, but I would put my aptitude as a piano technician still at sort of the apprentice level right. with what I know. I mean, you know, I know how to touch up a tuning and I know how to touch up a little bit of voicing and I know, I know how to tune a piano and touch up a regulation, but I'm not who you want to hire to rebuild your action yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that person. So I, in, a, in a sense, from the, the technical side, I, I do understand and sympathize with that. You, you know just enough to be dangerous. Sometimes I find that economy of communication can actually be powerful to not, you know, to give a a very short answer from a position of authority is sometimes more meaningful than typing back an essay (laughs) and giving that, that information back. No, no no question. And I have the Zen version of that. My friend, this is all based on trust. This is all custom work. If you don't have faith in me, and that I've been doing this for four decades or so, and that I'm good, and you can see what I got on my website. If you can't trust me, then we can't work together. Right. I mean, in this era, the people who are skilled at communication do seem to be getting ahead a little bit. And that's actually a bit of a barrier to many of us. I mean, a lot of people do what I do and became pianists because the kind of communication that was considered normal when I was a teenager was harder to do. Yeah. And, you know, and in the tech community, I run into the same thing as well, where, you know, sometimes written or verbal communication skills could be better than what they are. Uh, not that the information is incorrect because that's not the case, but you know, the, the people that are, that, that can really hone in on the communication skill tend to have more success this way. And it's pretty interesting to see. And of course, then there's the ultimate version of communication in which you as the technician community have to take some terrible, badly worded verbal comment and complaint that I give you about what the piano sounds like or feels like, and then translate that into 
some sort of action that's going to improve the situation. And automatically assume that you're, oh, you're one of those ego-filled, you know, kind of subtly and unconsciously ego-filled people that think you really do know more than I, and you got to verify everything I tell you. And it's well, if, some of the reading I've done sort of suggests that some of the pickiest people I've seen online uh -huh. are in the digital piano community where they're not used to the, I mean, the, one of the things that I've come to understand in my brief technical training is that the imperfection is everywhere. There's little bits of imperfection everywhere and even some of the finest instruments and learning to sort of manage that to, for example, just tune a good unison. And so a lot of the people on the digital side is that uh, technology has increased as memory has become cheaper and then the quality of the samples get better. They start to freak out when they hear a little whisker of a false beat or they hear a little damper noise or they hear a little bit of that. And so the things that we take for granted as part of just the experience of playing a piano, you'll have pages on Piano World that are 10 pages long of people comp complaining about some odd noise that this model is making which is just an artifact of an actual piano. Exactly. Wow. Hey, Ethan. Yeah. Man, I don't know how you're feeling, or I don't know how everybody else feels, but I am loving this. This yeah. is getting to things that are kind of at the heart of where players and technicians really have to interface. It has to be a high-end exchange. It has to be clear communication. Or For else sure. You know, one thing that came up for me while you guys were talking about communication is just what I find is interesting about the overlap with being a piano technician is the more I learn about communication, the more I learn that it's about listening. You know, it's not about talking. It's about listening and processing what going on and so that's that's actually a bonus for us as piano technicians we're great listeners um, and we just have to extend that to the relationship side of things Ac actually reading a book right now called never split the difference about a fbi trained hostage negotiator you know talking about negotiating tough negotiations and making sure you get what you need to get out of them turns out the book is just all about listening you know and asking the right questions not necessarily talking a lot. So yeah, that, that's a brilliant point, Ethan, because you know some of the best concert technicians I've ever worked with will take the time, you know, if they have if they're uh, assigned to a venue, for example, and they're not just going per service, uh, will take the time to sit back and actually listen to me play the piano for a while before we have a conversation about what needs to happen. And so that it is a tricky thing because you're experts enough in your field that you'll hear something and you'll know exactly what you want to do, but it's important to have that conversation with the client and, and sort of build that trust and build that communication uh, for sure. Do you have any other uh, questions that have popped in in the chat that you'd like me to answer? Yes. Yeah, sh well, sure. Well, I definitely have a comment here, but I'll follow up what you just said with when we had uh, our master class with, with Sally Phillips for a piano technician's master classes, one thing she highlighted was, you know, don't fix anything for a pianist that doesn't need it to be fixed. You know, because if you're, if it's a contrast situation and you have a half hour left to get everything right and you find something problematic and you start diving into it and then the player comes over and they're like, what just happened to the piano I was just working at? It's a way different story from you walking over to them and saying, hey, like, I think I can do this and that. Do you want me to? And they say, oh, no, 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 no. I want you to do this. Like, this is what matters to me as a piano, as the pianist. So I, I feel like there's a lot of direct application to, and, and also less work, more efficient work. Um, when you listen to what some, what somebody cares about and what they need in their particular situation. This comment I'll read from Stephen Russo, another great little anecdote. When the piano book first came out, he bought a case from Larry Fine and when he came to an unserviceable instrument after a nominal charge for the service call, he gave them a copy of the piano book. That was before the information superhighway, but it cemented a client. Yeah, I think that's great. Oh, that is great. Yeah, that, 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 and we do hear stories sometimes of customers that will walk in the store with a pricing supplement in their hand and sort of, you know, as part of the negotiating tactics of, you know, well, you know, the retail price says this, but, you know, the, the book says I should expect to pay somewhere in this range. And so yeah, it, it's, it's funny to hear, you know, we get comments from people at all different levels. Uh, and you're able to, by the way, comment at the website on our articles and on our reviews. So in addition to just reaching us by email, you can sort of provide additional commentary. And we'll, I mean, we, we moderate those to an extent just to keep ads out of there, but 
we're, we're happy to hear some some feedback from the technician community as well, especially with some of the instruments that we're reviewing and that and, and, and other products. Here's a, a a question which you don't have to go crazy over or whatever you have for we kind of already asked it but um nancy asks please speak to your opinion of the future of the piano industry she said is the piano going the way of the harpsichord any thoughts on that <laughs> oh that's a that's a good way to ask that question that's a good question no i don't think the piano is going the way of the harpsichord yet uh it's one of the one of the toughest parts about all of this and as, as a performer that, that plays some, some, you know, modern compositions from living composers is, you know, editorializing, hey, which, which pieces do you think are going to be significant? <laughs> which things are going to last and stand the test of time? You can't know that. You can take your best guess based on your own experiences. But I think that the piano will survive. I think that the market for the piano, I mean, the number of brands that we see out there, honestly, like we're in the middle of this crisis right now. This crisis is going to have an impact. You know, because people that are, you know, people that are in the industry are kind of burning down whatever reserves they have just to stay open. Yep. And so that, that's going to result in some changes to the, to the retail landscape. It may result in some changes to some companies that may be poorly financed. Uh, we may see continu a continuation of some of the more wealthy entities eating up some of the other manufacturers. Yeah. Now, what we've seen with that has been generally pretty positive. I mean, with the Pearl River acquisition of Schimmel, for example, or with uh, Parsons' acquisition of Grotrian, they're still being allowed to create their top-line instruments with their, you know, with honestly probably even better financial backing. That's exactly. Right. And so, you know, it's not always a negative. Uh, these these mergers and these takeovers aren't always negative. I think that the Yamaha acquisition of Gusendorfer, for example. I guess probably the, the biggest argument is whether the new series, the VC series of Bussendorfer pianos that are being released of the Grands, you know, how much influence and where is that influence coming from? But I'm assured by the people that I talk to on their Vienna side of the operation that these are original designs that are coming from their side and that they're just happy to have this level of backing to do the kind of R&D work they want to do. Have you played one, Owen? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I just was blown away. I, I do have a little bit of a crush on the 214 VC. Yeah. I do not have a bank account to handle it. That's right. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. Hope you live long enough to get to the used market for those. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, uh, I, I would imagine that you'd probably see a piano bar review of that line coming up pretty soon, if, if I were to guess, because uh, they've been kind of redesigning a lot of that lineup. But yeah, so I think the industry is going to continue the number of owners might shrink, but I think, you know, the number of brands might shrink a little bit. And for me, and as, I, as I'm sure a lot of the tech community appreciates as well, I, I do like having the choice. I like having the diversity of choices available yeah. to me, you know, including the rebuilt market as well, yeah. including, you know, having a couple of finished stock rebuilds available to play, you know, without getting into all, a, a huge side discussion of, all right, well, what hammers do you like? And what voicing protocol do you like? And what do you think is the perfect tone? And I, I love the fact that there isn't one good answer to this. And I'm always skeptical of those who are going to yell at me and tell me that this is the best answer and this is the only answer. I enjoy the variety just as I enjoy, you know, having friends of all different viewpoints. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the dogmatic side when, my God, this is, the, this is the road to Rome and it's the only road to Rome and... This is the way Rome is achieved. That's ridiculous. You know, I, I, I personally know so many awesome artisan rebuilders that come at things from radically different viewpoints and it works because it, because they're, they're artisans. So Mr. Janney, yes, uh, sir. the old clock on the wall is ticking down to zero hour. Yeah. Yeah. We still have some questions in the chat, but we're probably going to have to drop out of them. I guess that just means that was a good, a good interview. We had some lively commentary in the chat and, and feedback in here. So maybe we can uh, get to those type of questions in another episode. Owen, thank you so much for being here. Pat, also, if you could grab the, uh, the review link and put that in the chat. So if, if anybody wants to give feedback, we really appreciate that. It helps us improve the offering here. Uh, uh, Ethan, could you put one little YouTube clip in there so they can hear the level of this man's playing? Uh, we'll put his uh, website link in. There uh, you go. That's pretty easy to do. Yeah. 
Well, that'd be, that'd be wonderful. And I really appreciate the opportunity to just be with all of you. I, I, I just enjoy having the conversation and just the questions and the stimulation of doing something else that, that isn't just sitting around the house. So I, I, I love it. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time and joining me here. And again, Owen at Piano Buyer, if you want to send me an email, uh, pianobuyer.com if you'd like to check out the website of the Piano Buyer. And we look forward to seeing you back out there in the field and God knows out in the halls one day soon. I, I just, I, I look forward to that day again. Listen, For sure. we, we, we could go another hour. I got tons of questions. I know other people are, are really getting stimulated now. We'll do it another time. We'll talk more about Chinese pianos. This is great. Thank you so much. Now I feel awesome. like I, I know you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Ethan. And again, to the rest of the audience, it's, it's really great. And I hope that those of you who are just logging on, I mean, they're doing this out of the goodness of their hearts, but I've heard really wonderful things about the Piano Technicians Masterclass series as well. And so I hope that you'll consider that as part of your educational toolbox, as I know I will. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And I just put a link in the chat there. If you want to sign up for Piano Technicians Masterclasses, the link's there. The feedback link is in the chat as well. So make sure you grab that and give us your feedback. And uh, with that, I will say we'll, we'll sign off our, our live stream right now. And then uh, I will also just uh, end the Zoom call a couple, couple seconds later. Bye, folks. See you next week. See you guys later. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.